Leidy is quintessentially that figure of the old natural history. He's bound by a different set of scientific ethics. I think we all fell in love with Joseph Leidy, those of us on the team, because he was such a gracious fellow, so smart, so focused on his work, so generous with his time. Um, you know, William Parker Folk was an amateur. He was a, a Philadelphia lawyer who liked to hunt for fossils. And he started, he heard about these bones and he realized that, wow, this might be something related to things that I'd heard about at lectures at the academy. And he spent his summer vacation digging holes all around Haddonfield until he found these things and then wrote to Leidy. And, and again, Leidy, the professional, the, you know, the, pretty much the head of paleontology in this country, stopped what he was doing, went out to Haddonfield, dug up the bones, um, worked side by side with this amateur paleontologist and, until they got everything out. And the actual rooms and atmosphere of the Victorian era and the colorful characters involved in those historic 1868 events. There is, for instance, a section of the workshop-like office of Dr. Joseph Leidy. He documented and recognized the stunning significance of the 1858 Haddonfield fossil bone find. ...with Dr. Joseph Leidy here at the Academy, probably the only person in North America at the time who was able to receive them and understand what they were and their scientific value. So... Colleagues were appalled. Joseph Leidy, most of all. He could see that paleontology was moving beyond the reach of gentlemen naturalists. Staying in the game would require deep pockets, institutional support, and a willingness to compete with the likes of Cope and Marsh. Leidy is quintessentially that figure of the old natural history. He's bound by a different set of scientific ethics. He realizes that these two guys are playing a very different sort of game, operating in very different kinds of ways. I just don't think he has the stomach for it. Edward Drinker Cope had already made a name for himself with the discovery of the second known American dinosaur skeleton a creature he named Lelops. A self-taught prodigy, he'd been captivated by science since childhood. Cope took a great interest in natural history, and at a very young age, he gained admission to the Academy of Natural Sciences, which was not open to the public in those days. And he would make drawings of ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs from the time that he was nine years old. He was a brilliant fellow. Cope haunted the academy through his teens, learning anatomy, organizing collections of fish and snakes, developing a passion for fossils. Like his mentor, Joseph Leidy, the discoverer of Hadrosaurus and America's first paleontologist, Cope was a gentleman naturalist, following in the footsteps of Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, men deeply devoted to understanding the natural world. None of them have what we would regard as a credential or advanced training. They have no PhDs because American colleges are not granting PhDs. Cope is part of that older gentleman's world. Cope was thriving too. The death of his father left him with a sizable inheritance. Now he could finance his own fossil hunting expeditions and compete with Marsh head to head. In the summer of 1876, leaving his wife and young daughter behind in Philadelphia, Cope set out for the desolate bone fields of Montana, just weeks after Custer's defeat at Little Bighorn. He was absolutely warned, don't do this, bad idea. In the town of Fort Benton, Cope tried to hire a crew to help him in the field, but found no takers. The local men strongly advised him to carry a gun. But Cope was a Quaker, he was a pacifist, he didn't believe in violence, uh, and so he wouldn't hear of it. Cope loved being in the field, and he took risks. He would go out to the Judith River country in Montana. I'd go hiking up these ravines where the horses nearly fell to their death, and he, he, he would be warned of Lakota war parties of Sioux warriors. Didn't care. The fossil hunting, he wrote his daughter Julia, 
was very good indeed. We find in the high rocks, there are many bones and teeth of huge fossil reptiles like Lelops and Hadrosaurus. They were as large as elephants, but their teeth were very small, no larger than the end of my little finger. Cope made one discovery after another, turning out papers at a rate that would make him the most prolific author in American scientific history. Somehow, Cope could look out at the rocks and see the unfolding story of the deep past. He could show how you could start with an animal like Phenacodus, this mammal that looked a little like a sheep with the toes of a raccoon, and very reasonably evolve it, tinker with the feet and the teeth, and you could get a horse, you could get a rhino, you could get a taper, you could get an antelope. By 1897, Cope's health had failed his body now ravaged by severe kidney disease. In his room in Philadelphia, Cope was treating himself with massive amounts of morphine and belladonna when he received an unexpected call. A young artist named Charles Knight implored Cope to help him show the world what dinosaurs had looked like when they walked the earth. Even though he was close to death, the scientist brought out his private notebooks to help the artist put flesh on the bones he had spent a lifetime unearthing and trying to understand. For the better part of two weeks, Cope brings the vanished world to life. How these creatures stood, how they walked across the landscape, what they fed on. That imaginative leap from anatomy to life. In some ways, it's the last testament of this paleontologist uh, who only has a little time left. When they were finally done, an exhausted Cope asked Knight to help him hide the notebooks under his bed. Even at the end of his life, Cope was sure that if he let down his guard for a minute, Marsh would steal his work. A few days later, he was found dead in his room at age 56.